But that's okay, folks, because I've got my think tank in here tonight. Criminal defense attorneys Michael Bixon and Fallon Stokes and Municipal Court Judge, the Honorable Tiffany Porter. Welcome, everyone. Hi. Closing arguments eve, okay? All the evidence is in, right? 56 witnesses, 500 exhibits, 13 days of this stuff. As we sit here right now, who's got to bring it tomorrow? Is it the prosecution or defense? Who has to bring it? I think the defense. The defense has a lot to bring forth, and they've been doing a great job with keeping a very aggressive defense going forward with the experts, with putting Ezra up on the stand. I mean, the entire defense that they put forth is strong. It's very forthcoming. I think they put, you know, they've done a great job so far at what they've done. But I think the case is really going to rest on this closing. I think this is what's really going to sell it or break it at the end. Who's got to bring it? The defense. They have to. This is the time where you have I like to when it's, By the way, I like when it's advantage prosecution on closing argument eve, but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> this is when the defense has to uh, pretty much paint their story and make sure they go through it thoroughly so that the jurors understand exactly what happened and you want the jury to understand what happened to your client and why the events took place. They must lay everything out on the table. It's really for them to close this up, seal, to seal the deal. I agree. I agree with both of my uh, counterparts here today that this is important for the defense to drive it home. It's a self-defense case. You know, it's important for them to humanize McCandless to show that she's a victim. And that's what the defense has to drive home to make this jury believe that she was defending herself and she wasn't trying to commit murder in this situation. Can they, uh, and here's, the, that's an interesting point that you bring up, but can they do that based upon her demeanor and the way she testified? Sort of, I, I, I can't describe it. I mean, you're talking about a moment where you believed your life was at stake and you had to stab someone 16 times and it was very matter of fact, detached. Uh. I think it's, you know, again, callous. How, well, again, it's how you Cold. describe. Look, no <laughs> two people are going to respond. Remorseless. Well, that, I think that's what the prosecutors are going to say, absolutely. But from the defense, no two people are going to react to such a traumatic experience. And for some, they're just going to shut down emotionally. And it's going to become this cold recitation of the facts because to become emotionally invested in it is to go into that situation again. I think if they're able to bring out the PTSD and the lack of memory and the sexual assault and explain it in the right way, they're going to be just fine. So do you think they can explain that away to this jury? Because, I mean, the jury was in the room with her and, and they're seeing her every day. They're, they're, they're feeling it. They, they saw her when she's blushing when the ex walks in. They saw her as she callously, remorselessly described killing Alex Woodworth. I mean, I think that's critical. The jurors are going to see, and you look at a defendant's demeanor when they're sitting there the entire trial, and especially in her situation when she was on the stand and testified. And it's important to try and show that emotion because it was such a, a traumatic event. Even though if she had PTSD, it's something that she may have had memory loss, but it's something traumatic that happened. But I think that's why the defense is going to have to really drive it home. Is there any way any juror could connect with her? Feel any sort of connect? Don't they have to connect to her to some extent? They to, do. To, to, they do. And that's where good acting comes in and good trial techniques as a defense attorney. You have to get up there. And I would go through everything that transpired in that car, even taking the evidence in my hand, showing how uh, she stabbed him, what happened. You have to uh, pretty much do a reenactment for the jurors so that they don't think about her smiling at her, you know, ex-lover or whoever he is, uh, you know, and they don't think about those things and how her demeanor was on the stand. You want to think, you want to make an impact and they really have to, you know, like I said, bring in their acting chops and, <laughs> and uh, you know, I, be convincing. Because I, I think it's a case where the lawyers have to make that connection with the jury because I don't think yes. they're connected to Ezra McCandless. But that's just me from here. What do I know? What do I know? Julia Post testified today, and this was, uh, I thought, interesting. It, it was part of the rebuttal case for prosecutors, but this is someone who grew up with Ezra McCandless, went to grade school, went to middle school, went to high school. Think about it. If, if a friend of yours was called into court to talk about your character, someone you went to grade school, middle school, and high school with, what would they say? Here's what Julia said. Did you go to school with her through middle school, high school? Yes. And were you friends with the defendant? Yes. Do you have an opinion as to the defendant's character for truthfulness or untruthfulness? 
Yes, I do. And what is that opinion? They are not very truthful. So did you have an opinion about the defendant's uh, truthfulness before you saw the articles in the news or before this came out on March 22nd, 2018? Yes. And what was that opinion? My opinion was that this person is not very truthful. Yikes. Well, I think we know she's not very truthful, right? Uh, come right. on. No, 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 no. Middle school and high school. And grade school. And, and even then, really? she takes a stand claiming to be her friend, and she's friends with someone who's not very truthful? It just sort of seems like there's... You know a friends like that? No. no. I, I know a couple friends that truthful. stretch the truth a little bit. I mean, but you saw how she acted towards her. I mean, it didn't seem like that was the kind of friend who would get up there and say something like that. There seemed to be a little like a bit of a... Friend right. Right. That friend is not going to get on the stand and then no. say, I wasn't truthful in because elementary Because you are truthful. In middle school. But I she's mean, sworn to tell the truth, the whole truth and not but the truth is friends. So she's got to tell the truth and no say one she's not truthful, right? ever lies when that happens. Right. right. So you didn't think that was powerful? That was not no. effective? No, jury. not at all. And if anyone takes that into account, I mean... Now, the jury has ridiculous. no idea what the basis is of this opinion, by the way. Just that... That's the way she feels about her. I mean, Mengel said the same thing. If anyone, from a, per, like a, a power perspective, I thought that was more powerful coming from him. Because right. we heard him say essentially those same words about her. Now, I think that his demeanor and how he talked about her actually helped the defense more than anything, which might be a little surprising. But I think coming from him, that was more powerful than from this girl. Well, let me ask you this. And a big theme of the prosecution case was that she is untruthful. She is a liar. That's what their cross-examination of Ezra McCann's was all about. Um, does this trial come down to either we believe her or we don't believe her for this jury, and that's how it'll end up in a conviction? Right, yeah. or that's how an you acquittal? have to start off your, that's how you, you have to start off your closing argument with, my client is a liar. My client lied about this, this, and this. But when it comes to this, she did not lie. And you have to bring that out as to why. But when and, it comes to the stuff that happened. would send her away to prison for the rest of her life, that's when she tells well, the truth. Well, but you have to, yes. And I've done it plenty of times with clients who have lied, lied to the police. And then, the, but the part of the story that was the actual crime, they were uh, truthful about. And I was able to be convincing enough. And I think if you tell the story the right way, that it can be convincing. But you have to hit it head on. You can't just glaze over that she's a liar. We already know she lied. But does the, does the whole trial come down to her testimony? We believe it or we don't? Or does the jury go to other places, do you think? No. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it goes comes down to if they do believe her or not. Like I said, it's a self-defense case. So if she testified how convincing she was on the stand when she testified, told the story because she's only one alive to, to tell it. So if they can relate to her and believe the words that she told, even though she may be still suffering from these events, she may not have shown the type of emotion that you would expect somebody who was in a traumatic situation as hers um, to show while they're testifying. But you can't judge. Every person is different. How one person may react on the stand in a traumatic event may be totally different how another may react. Oh, I, I understand that. But you, you, you said the jury has to relate to her. They're not, yeah. The jury's not going to relate to her. Not, not. No at, way. Look, from what we've seen on the stand so far, I think that there are issues that's going to be hard for them to believe. I think it's how you frame it as a defense attorney going forward. If I were them, this entire case would be revolving around a sexual assault survivor being betrayed by the police over and over again. It's, I honestly think, what it should have been from day one. Because if there's a reason why she's lying to the police, maybe it's because they didn't believe her the first time when this happened. Like we saw last time that she tried to report something. Now this happens all over again, and they start treating her as a defendant instead of a victim again. I think That's how you frame this dictates how this trial goes forward. And, and that all comes out in the closing arguments more. I absolutely it has think so. To, has to. Okay, there's another big... I, I want to skip ahead to the... Um, Facebook searches and and part of what happened today is the the judge was talking about um, they wanted to get in some Facebook searches done by Alex Woodworth the victim in this case take a listen all right well here's what I'm going to do again the state had indicated they would not uh, require a foundation witness essentially in this case imagine to be a records custodian or a certificate uh, from a record custodian um, and uh, so what I'm going to order is that we have the, the whole record from, from Facebook from February 24 to the March 22nd. And that entire record can come in. And uh, the uh, defense can present uh, that portion that shows a search on March 6th. And the court will take judicial notice then 
uh, that there are no other uh, searches uh, for any of those uh, persons or variations of their names. So the Facebook search is done by the victim in this case. Remember the, the concept here, you're talking about a love triangle to a certain extent, where you've got Alex Woodworth and you've got Jason Mengel and Ezra McCandless. And the victim, Alex, is searching Jason on Facebook and searching Ezra on Facebook. The defense wanted in, they get it in. Are they they're trying to portray the victim as some sort of stalker here? I mean, anyone who's on Facebook knows that you search people on Facebook, don't you? Don't well, you look them up, right? Right? <laughs> well, I think I've looked up all three of you on Facebook, by the way. Scandalous. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's just showing his level of involvement in this and showing that he's not necessarily being, you know, stalked or pursued just by Ezra, but that he was a part of this too. And I think it's very important for them to bring out in this case. Well, yeah, I think it is too. And even when we talk about Jason Mangle, it was points where she, he was following McCann listen point in point. So, I mean, it, it shows her as a victim. You have here the victim in this case, Woolworth, who was doing Facebook searches, looking her up, seeing what she was trying to do, seeing what Jason was doing if they were together, because supposedly he was in love with her. He may have been infatuated. And at the same time, I think it just portrays and paints her as a victim even more when you have these two men in this love triangle who both have the same you know, common denominator, the same, they want her. Yeah, but is she the victim? She has a boyfriend. Her boyfriend goes away on training, so she sleeps with two of his friends while he's gone. Abusive boyfriend, and then allegedly sexually assaulted by another one, and then on her terms, used by the other one. Right. By I don't three think the jury's going to buy it. You think the jury is actually going to buy that? I don't. That's I think why it's how I said, you sell it. It's how that's you sell why, it. Well, that's why the defense has such an uphill battle, but I, I it still is an think uphill it's battle. going I agree to be hard to portray her as a victim in this and oh it's a you know, very difficult we know job. how women are looked at and she's one woman with three men they already don't like her and and, and it's going to be hard i mean it, it really is i agree i think the key is her age though she's just 22. she is young she's young so the, the, i mean and and jason uh he's like is in his 30s he's like 13 years older than yeah. she is so that's that's an issue in the case um so closing arguments again tomorrow morning when we come back, folks, we've got a lot more to take a look at. We're going to give you like kind of like a, a recap of the entire defense case when we return. If you have Medicare, listen up. The Medicare enrollment deadline is only weeks away. With so many changes, do you know if your plan is still the right fit? Having the wrong plan may cost you thousands of dollars out of pocket. And that's why I love Health Markets, your insurance marketplace. With their new Fit Score, they compare thousands of plans from national insurance companies to find the right Medicare plan that fits you. Call or visit Health Markets to find your Fit Score today. In minutes, you can find out if your current plan is the right fit or if there's another one that can get you extra coverage or help save you money. Best of all, their service is completely free. Does your plan have $0 copays, $0 deductibles, and $0 premiums? If not, maybe it's not the right fit. Does it include dental and vision coverage? Well, if not, maybe it's not the right fit. How about hearing aids, glasses, and gym memberships at no additional cost? Maybe there's a better fit for you. Call Health Markets now or visit healthmarkets.com for your free fit score. We can instantly compare thousands of Medicare plans with all of these benefits and more, including plans that may let you keep your doctor and save money. With the annual Medicare enrollment deadline coming, don't waste another minute not knowing if you have the right Medicare fit. For this free service, go to healthmarkets.com or call right now. Having help enroll people in millions of policies with an A-plus customer satisfaction rating? You can trust Health Markets. Don't assume that your plan is still the right fit. The Health Markets Fit Score makes it easy to find the right Medicare plan for you. Health Markets doesn't just work for one insurance company. They work to help you, and they do it all for free. Your insurance marketplace, Health Markets. There may be Medicare benefits and savings you're missing out on. Only Health Markets has the free fit score. Call 800-290-6422 before the deadline. That's 800-290-6422. Attention. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has officially authorized new benefits that Medicare Advantage plans may include. To get the benefits you deserve, you can call the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. If you're on Medicare, this is important information. I called the Medicare Coverage Helpline and they instantly looked up my coverage. In this one simple call, they offered to enroll me in a plan 
that includes rides to medical appointments, private home aides, doctors and nurses visits by telephone, and even home delivered meals. The plan also includes dental, vision, hearing, and prescription drug coverage, all at no additional cost. Don't delay. Call to see if the new benefits are available in your area. Call the number on your screen now. It's free. Call 1-800-497-5903. That's 1-800-497-5903 now. Sarah, what's wrong? Well, Dan and I don't have health insurance, and I'm really worried if something bad happens, we can go broke paying medical bills. Well, have you tried calling the Health Advisors toll-free line? No. What's that? Anyone who's looking for health insurance or a better plan or a lower price can call. Do you need health insurance for you or your family? Anyone who wants health insurance or anyone who just needs a better plan or a lower price, even if you have pre-existing conditions or no insurance at all, can now call the Health Advisor toll-free helpline. Don't worry if you've missed the deadline in the past. The Health Advisor toll-free helpline has been extended to help anyone who wants health insurance coverage now or anyone who just needs a better plan or a lower price. Call 800-806-6217. The call is 100% free, but hurry, get covered before it's too late. Call 800-806-6217, 800-806-6217. So the defense wrapped up their case, prosecution wrapped up their rebuttal case today. But I want to take a moment here to take a look at what the defense presented, because this isn't just any old case. This is a case of self-defense. Take a look. When I laid down, Alex had started to come into the car with me and posi position himself above me. He deserved this. He, I had betrayed him. I went back to Jason. He was upset about this and that he deserved me. After he kisses me and I pull my head back a bit, I felt he touched the hem of my sweater, but I could feel it start to give away. It felt looser, and my sweater had been opened. After that, he moves to my pants. I could feel the knife start to graze and cut into my skin. Looking at these injuries, are you able to determine from looking at any of these injuries how they occurred? All you can state is they occurred with a sharp object. Are they consistent with being inflicted on Miss McCandless's body by another human being? Yes. I'm afraid he's gonna kill me because he has a knife. And I'm afraid that he's going to take whatever he wants and he's just going to finish this. What are you afraid of now? I'm afraid he's going to kill me. You asked her, what were you scared of? She said, being hurt. You asked by who, and she said, Alex. Agreed. Agreed. What happens when, well, you decided to name the groin. Did you actually do it? Yes. What happens then? He reacts and he drops the knife at that point. When he drops the knife, what do you do? Instantly, I grab the knife and I have pulled, I've used my arm to pull myself into the footwell. And that's when it, that's when everything really starts to happen. As I'm trying to make my way to the open door, Alex grabs me by the throat and I'm pressed, my body and my head is pressed against the driver's side back of the seat. His hand slips from my throat and it moves to the back of my head where he grabs my hair. What happens when he grabs your hair, do you remember? I remember as he grabbed my hair, he was holding it very tight and he was pulling my face towards him and I remember that's when I had stabbed him inside the head. Before he gets out of the car and you're doing the stabs, are you trying to kill him? No. What are you trying to do? I just want to get away. I need to get out of the car. I need to get away as fast as I could. At some point, does he let go? Yes. When he lets go, what does he do? He didn't just let go. He had ripped my hair out from my head. And he then got out of the car. I heard him say to me was that he needed help to go to the bathroom. He needed help doing this. When he said to you he needs help going to the bathroom, what do you do? 
I instantly just wanted to help him, so I got out of the car and I approached him. Mr. Um, Woodward's larynx was not cut. That is correct. So he could talk. That is possible. Right. And he could not only just talk before he died for some time, he could walk. Correct? That would be correct. When you leave, where is Alex? Alex is still laying on his coat. Do you know, or did, had you noticed whether or not he had his shoes on at that point or not? He still had his shoes on at that point. And when you say he's laying on his coat, where is he laying on his coat? He's laying on his coat near the green trailer. If, if he had suffered the majority of these wounds in a vehicle, would he be able to get out, walk for 10 to 15 feet, lay down, and then get back into a vehicle? I would say yes. Again, none of these wounds would prevent him from doing those things. Would he be able to take off his coat? Yes, I would think so. Would he be able to take off his shoes? Yes. Stress impairs retrieval. So people can have things that are in their memory and stored in long-term memory, but they may not be able to retrieve them because they're stressed. Give me your first name. You don't know your first name? All right, folks, a new episode of Court TV's podcast is out today. Ezra McCandless took the stand in her own defense. But Seema and I take a closer look at the testimony of her ex, Jason Mangle. What impact did his surprisingly combative appearance have on the trial? Did he help the prosecution's argument that Ezra McCandless murdered Alex Woodworth in an effort to get Jason back in her life? The victim was one of her ex-lovers, but her ex-boyfriend, Jason Mengel, he took the stand and he's made it quite an impact. The reaction of the defendant to him, to me, was more powerful than his testimony for the prosecution. Smitten kitten. Unbelievable. And you're talking about a murder defendant here. Her life is on the line and she is more concerned about, oh my goodness, he's in the room. It was uncomfortable to watch. I felt like I should just leave. But very revealing. <laughs> you can listen to the latest episode on Stitcher or Apple and Google, 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 Google Podcasts. You can always find it, of course, on CourtTV.com. We'll be right back. There's something broken in this man. Starting Monday. He's a sociopath. Harvey Weinstein, a Court TV exclusive primetime event. Seema Iyer sits down with the accusers. I walked up to his room with such confidence and walked down feeling I was worth nothing. And the attorneys. They cannot prove these were non-consensual encounters. He knows what he's done. The Weinstein Rape Trial. Exclusive interviews, Monday at 8, only on the all-new Court TV. This is an important message for anyone with Medicare or who expects to join soon. This card I'm holding in my hand, it's an example of an all-in-one Medicare Advantage membership card. The kind of Medicare coverage that comes with this simple little card can help you in so many ways. The Medicare Advantage plan that I've got, it has paved the way for more independence. It's all-inclusive. They take care of all my pharmacy. They take care of all my medical. They take care of my doctor bills. I actually don't even have to pay for a doctor visit, and that's fantastic. If you're already on original Medicare or you're about to become eligible, you may be familiar with Parts A and B. Those cover your doctor visits and hospital care, things you'll also get in an all-in-one Medicare Advantage plan. But all-in-one Advantage cardholders may get so much more. I have only one card, and that card helps me with my vision costs, my dental costs, my pharmacy costs, my doctor costs. Let's scroll a list of the potential benefits that can be covered with this single kind of card. And remember, in addition to all of this, you're still getting the Medicare, hospital, and medical benefits to which you're entitled. Oh, and are you sitting down? These plans may have a $0 monthly premium depending on where you live, no matter your health status or how much money you earn each year. It is not trickery at all when you hear $0. I'm, I, I'm proof positive. I love the $0 plans. That fits my pocketbook really well. <laughs> 
Compared to original Medicare recipients, people with one of these all-in-one Medicare plans had 23% fewer hospital stays and 33% fewer emergency room visits, while also receiving more physician office tests and services. I love my Medicare Advantage plan. I wouldn't get away from it for anything in the world. It's perfect for me. I have been able to go out and live a healthy lifestyle, been able to do all the things that I need need health-wise, and because I'm able to do that, I feel good about myself, and it has saved me so much money. One card, one company, one complete and convenient package of Medicare benefits to help you get well or stay well. And for one low or no monthly plan premium. That's the kind of value you can't afford to ignore. So why not find out more right now? Here's how. Call 800-525-7153 or visit thiscard800.com for free information about this incredible card with no obligation of any kind. This is free information that could give you more coverage for less money. Call 800-525-7153 or go online now to learn more. Attention cancer victims who use the weed killer Roundup. A federal jury unanimously found that Monsanto's popular weed killer Roundup was a substantial factor in causing cancer. You may be entitled to substantial compensation. If you or someone you love used Roundup and were diagnosed with cancer, call the number on your screen now. Don't wait. There may be time deadlines to file a claim. Call 800-549-6270. That's 800-549-6270. And when did you uh, first get to know the defendant? I met her at Racy's. Jason brought her to Racy's and introduced me. Uh, there was a day that we went. I went to the coffee shop, and I was visiting Alex there, and she was there as well. Um, she came up, and she ordered a mocha from me. Um, she paid me, tipped me, and then she talked to people that were seated at the counter. Was that? A little bit unusual? Yeah. And why was that unusual? She rarely paid, and she never tipped. Do you remember approximately when you learned about that relationship? I kind of, I don't know, I, I kind of knew something was up at points, but I didn't really finitely know until uh, the night that I had the conversation with him, with him and John Hansen at Racy's. I could see it through the windows at Racy's outside. So, and I could... I could see Jason moving his arms a lot. He had a very angry face. And then he came inside and asked John to come outside with him. And then asked, after he had John come outside with him, asked Alex to come outside with him. He was a very stern, angry voice. Jason found out and had a fit at Racy's. Ezra got stressed out and blew up at me for not talking about my past. Woke up to a text asking me to forget her name and not talk to her again. Those were the friends who sort of hang out at Racy's Coffee Shop in Eau Claire. They all were at Racy's. They all knew everybody involved here, especially the victim and the defendant and the uh, ex-boyfriend. They would hang out at this coffee shop in Eau Claire, a big part of this trial. In fact, there was some surveillance video from inside Racy's that was shown to this jury as well. So that's why we thought tonight we would take you inside our own little coffee shop here on the couch on closing arguments we've all got our mugs and we're ready to talk about what was taking place inside this coffee shop and, and i just want to start with the scene that this whole trial involves relationships and people who met and interacted with each other at the coffee shop and contemplated life this is the center of the universe for everything that happened in this trial i mean almost every single person they've had come in and talk about them who knew them in some way or fashion, at least went to this coffee shop at least once. I mean, I'd imagine this entire town at some point has gone to this coffee shop from what we've seen from this trial so far. And one of the, it's described as, as, as a good coffee shop, but it's like the coolest, hippest place in town to <laughs> hang out. Uh, first of all, are you surprised that we're talking about a murder shop coming out of a coffee shop where hipsters hang out? A bit, especially in Wisconsin, but I mean, where else are they gonna go? I mean, that's just a small atmosphere small nucleus group of people, but you know, that's a place where people go. If they find a place that's home, they make friends, communicate, 
and just talk about stuff. It's kind of like being in a salon or barbershop. Conversations just that's a great that's up. a great analogy. Right, you know? And this is a Eau Claire is a college town. I mean, right. we've got three colleges uh, uh, there, and a lot of these young folks are baristas. They're students, former students, philosophers, contemplating life. Uh, one person, though, who, who wasn't quite as young as the college kids hanging out there was Jason Mengel. This is the man who prosecutors say was the motive for the murder. This was the man that Ezra McCandless loved and wanted back. Well, he testified as one of the people who was at Racy's, uh, spending a lot of time there, who testified in this murder trial. Take a listen. Now, um, is there an age difference between you and the defendant? Yes. I did not know his large when I started, but. And when you say you didn't know it was that large when you started, did you think she was older than she actually is? I thought she was older and there were like strange, like, you know, I noticed a, like on a, on a random, like I noticed a, a tassel, like a high school tassel from like your, your hat hanging in the car the first time we had met. And then I was going to look and see what year that said. And it was gone like the next time I met her. So I was like, hmm. But like yeah, like she just she. I think it was like uh, like she never mentioned her age, but like I had heard like her life stories, so like I was assuming at that age. And if you're thirty five ish now, yeah. would she be about thirteen to fifteen years younger? Yeah, something like that. Okay. It's kind of like the old guy hanging out at the coffee shop with the college kids. I mean, right. what does the jury do with that? With that fact and that scenario there? Well, they might be able to show that she was manipulated. She was manipulated by this older man, and that uh, you know she was easily um, what is it? Easily swayed uh, by this older man, and that's why she was just so in love with him. And he probably said all the right things that she needed to hear. Uh, I'm wondering why is he hanging out at the coffee shop with uh, college students or college age students, especially after he saw the tassel. He knew. He knew what was going on. Yeah. What, 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 what do you think is going on there? And ultimately, does the jury not like him because of that? He's the, he's the old guy, right? He's the yeah. old guy hanging out with the young kids. Well, I think it's, it's creepy. It goes back to my thought earlier. She's 22 and he's 35 hanging out at a coffee shop in a college town. You don't see too many 35-year-olds hanging around coffee shops near college campuses, you know, unless you work there, if you're a professor, or unless you're taking classes. Why is he there? But obviously, you know, he picked up on her. They started dating, and it's an older guy. So yeah. she could be very easily influenced by whatever he's asking her to do, whatever may, you know, come about. If she's cheating on him, you know, trying to correct that and fix that problem because he's an older guy and she wants to keep him. You know what's really interesting is they discussed um, the nature of their relationship and how they made this connection, and Mengel testified about that. Like an explanation on how it happened? Yeah, did she say that, um, did she say if she was, yes, how, how did it happen? They, they were both going through some things in life and she had, you know, she had been through something traumatic, he had been through traumatic things, so they kind of bonded over, like, you know, misery loves company kind of thing. All right, so what exactly do you, is the takeaway about the relationship? Michael, what do you think the takeaway is of the nature of their relationship? They sort of bonded over this misery they both sort of um, endured during their lives, although his life is a little bit longer than hers. If what we saw from the way that he talked about her, when he testified about the relationship and, uh, you know, calling her the defendant, saying that she was a liar, I mean, the whole way that he approached them, at least on the stand, was this very almost cold and calculating perspective of how he viewed her. And I think that the jury is going to take that into consideration when they look at his testimony. And when you look back at the way that even they first met, I think it sort of follows that same path. I don't think it helps the state when he sort of presents that side of their relationship, though. All right, there was another woman from Racy's who testified. Samantha is her name. And she talked a little bit about... The, the love triangle and the jealousies. And, and again, you're talking about Jason Mengel is the boyfriend of Ezra McCandless, and then he goes away and she starts seeing two other guys. One of them is the victim, Alex Woodworth. And when Jason finds out about Alex, Samantha knows about it because everyone's talking to each other at the coffee shop. Number 30, that's an outgoing message to you. Is that right? Could you read that for the jury? Yes. Things just went really bad between us, and I don't think she's going to be in town again. And how did you respond? 
Oh, f what happened? And then down below right there, um, how did Alex respond? Jason found out and had a fit at Racy's. Ezra got stressed out and blew up at me for not talking about my past. Woke up to a text asking me to forget her name and not talk to her again. All right, so now we've got the love triangle uh, taking place in here. It looks like Mengel wants Alex out of the picture. Out of the picture. How does that affect everything else that's happening here in, in terms of the allegations? I'm trying to piece these things together. There's a lot of drama but how does it get us to the truth? I don't think it really makes any sense, and I don't, I don't think the jury is going to put weight to that as to what Jason Mingle wanted because I don't, I don't think they have conveyed that she was doing something because of Jason and because she wanted to be with Jason, that that would be her motive to kill Alex. I don't, I don't think they conveyed that. Uh, and painted that picture. So I think it's going to be hard, and I think it's going to be for the jury to really decide uh, what they're going to take away from Jason and what they aren't. I mean, I think the age difference and what they were involved in, I think it's, you know, it's going to be hard for him as well. Do you think it's possible that the, that the jury believes that Ezra knows that Jason wants Alex out of the picture, so in her mind somehow she comes to the belief that if I kill him, that will show Jason that I really love him. It could. I mean, you're dealing with, you know, 22-year-olds and compared to this being a grown man who she's in this relationship, she's probably over her head and not really knowing what she's into, but she has this relationship with the victim, um, Woodworth, and if he wanted him out of the picture, it could paint that story that she could have done it because she wanted to get Jason back. But at the same time, I mean, I don't think the state has painted a picture or the defense well enough to say that that was the reason she did it. I think it's one of those things as if you're going to believe her story, that she was being attacked and it's self-defense, or if you don't and you just believe that she was just doing this because she wanted to get Jason back herself. Or maybe she just snapped, you know? It's maybe possible. It's just a and we've got, we've got lesser included. We've got lesser included, so, I mean, that part can, uh, you know, play a part in what the jury has to decide when they get the case. I want to talk about Aubrey, though, because Aubrey is a former manager of Racy. So she's like one of the people in charge of this place, the baristas and the customers. Take a listen. Um, she said, I don't recall, but he's not a friend. Fair to say that you told the police you've never liked Jason. Objection, Your Honor. It's not bias of a witness. The, it has to be, and this is 906.16, it has to be for purposes of attacking the credibility of a witness, evidence of bias, prejudice, or interest of the witness Judge objection. or against any Are party have, in cases. Hold on, we can only have one talk at a time. Are so, we going to have speaking objections? I didn't know that we were going to do speaking objections in front of the jury. All right, well, I, I also need my, my statute book if somebody has it. So. Or, I'll grab it. I, frankly, I, I don't think we need to have an extensive discussion on this. I, I do believe it goes, thank you, to bias of the witness. So I'm going to overrule the objection. Thank you. What I was asking, Aubrey, when you spoke with the police back in the spring of 2018, you told them you never liked Jason. Agreed? Agreed. You knew at that point that this young lady next to me, Ezra McCandless, was dating Jason, the man you didn't like. Agreed? I didn't believe they were together at that time. So the manager didn't even know whether or not they were together at the time, and there was some secrecy taking place inside Racy's, even though you would think everyone knew everyone else's business. How about the fact that she doesn't like Jason? Does the, if the jury is on board with Aubrey and they don't like Jason, does that help or hurt Ezra? I think it helps her. I mean, the state's How theory... How does that... Well, the state's theory is that Ezra is chasing after Jason. Right. So she's going to do anything it takes to get him back. But if they don't like the guy that she's trying to get back, if he doesn't seem like a likable guy, that you wouldn't want to go after him, it makes their theory that much, I guess, less believable. You know, and I think that they do have issues with it. Their theory has a lot of holes in it as to the motive as to why this could have happened. I mean, maybe that it did happen, but their motive isn't there. The motive is just really lacking. It's got a lot of holes in it. 
Right, and you're going to have the jury who is going to actually have to piece that motive together because we still don't have a concrete motive here. And we don't know why this occurred or, you know, what the catalyst was, let's say that. Uh, and it's going to be hard for the jurors to separate that. And they're going to ask the same questions we're asking. I'm sure when they talk that, uh, why did she do it? And what happened? And the, people are going to argue about this, Jason. So does anyone here like Jason? I didn't think he was no. likable. When he testified, using words like, I'm an empathetic person, he used other terms like he was an expert in some sort. <laughs> and I, I thought that was a bit annoying for me just watching it. But as a juror, I think he just wasn't someone that you could really relate to or you could feel sympathy for. I mean, it wasn't like painting a picture that he had this girlfriend that was He's very cheating. green. He rides a bicycle. Eh, he I guess. He rides a bicycle, like stalking her yes. to and Woodworth's another, house. He I mean, it's creepy. very possessive. Yeah, it is. Yeah. All right. So uh, Jenna, who is a, a friend of the defendant's, also uh, testified. And she talked about Jason as well. Take a listen. And then she responds that it's not healthy. We have a zero communication. Um, we have zero communication. And why do you respond with, yeah, his communication style is dot, dot, complicated? I was trying to be tactful in my response. Um, Jason Mengel's communication style is incredibly complicated. He unfortunately has not learned that words have the power to hurt people, regardless of your intention of those words, and often uses the excuse of trying to be honest when really he just sounds like a jerk. Wow. Wow. Jenna not mincing any words about Jason. She doesn't like him either. Not exactly He's the number harmful, one He's harmful, hurtful. I mean, I didn't really hear anything great about Jason during this trial. And, and I'll bring it back again. So you believe that's going to help the defense because... It makes him look like he's manipulating the defendant, which makes her more sympathetic because he's less sympathetic. Does he become the, the bad guy here? Like both of them, both Jason and Alex, they can point the finger at now? If, if not Alex, then definitely Jason. Jason. I agree with that. I mean, here with Alex, I mean, you may get sympathy. So we, sh we don't know what happened. All we know is what McCandless is saying and testifying what happened, that he was attacking her. She felt that she had to use um, a de deadly force to get him away or get him off of her. Um, but in the situation with Jason, you have other witnesses testifying, like he's not a likable guy, it's other aspects. She loved him though. She I mean, did. her reaction when he she's... walked in the courtroom, oh my, like I've never Tiffany seen a said. witness so smitten. Anyhow, <laughs> 22. All right. when we come back, we're gonna, we're gonna stay inside of a Racy's Coffee House and see what the folks inside have to say about the victim in the case, Alex Wood. Attention! The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has officially authorized new benefits that Medicare Advantage plans may include. To get the benefits you deserve, you can call the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. If you're on Medicare, this is important information. I called the Medicare Coverage Helpline and they instantly looked up my coverage. In this one simple call, they offered to enroll me in a plan that includes rides to medical appointments, private home aides, doctors and nurses visits by telephone, and even home delivered meals. The plan also includes dental, vision, hearing, and prescription drug coverage, all at no additional cost. Don't delay. Call to see if the new benefits are available in your area. Call the number on your screen now. It's free. Call 1-800-497-5903. That's 1-800-497-5903 now. Attention Roundup users. Are you an agricultural worker, farm worker, nursery worker, landscaper, or local highway worker or groundskeeper who has regularly used the weed killer Roundup? If so, have you ever developed cancer or non-Hodgkin's lymphoma? If you answered yes, you may be entitled to substantial financial compensation without going to court. In August of 2018, a jury ordered Monsanto, the makers of Roundup, to pay $289 million when a groundskeeper developed non-Hodgkin's lymphoma after using Roundup. Agricultural workers, Farm workers, nursery workers, landscapers, local highway workers, or groundskeepers who have regularly used the weed killer Roundup may be at risk for developing certain types of cancer. If you or a loved one developed cancer after using Roundup, you may be eligible for substantial financial compensation without going to court. Call the Negligence Network at 800-600-7884 for a free Roundup case evaluation. That's 800-600-7884. 800-600-7884.
We received this today. It looks like some sort of ransom note. And look how much they're asking for. Ma'am, this is a cable bill. <gasps> Fed up with high TV prices? Get Orbi TV, quality satellite TV for just $40 a month with no contract or credit check. All taxes are included, so the $40 package is just $40. This looks like a classic shakedown. <laughs> Available at Best Buy or go to OrbiTV.com for more information. Non-attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. See disclaimer for law firms. If you or a loved one were recently diagnosed with any form of lung cancer or mesothelioma, call right now. You may be entitled to financial compensation. Even if you smoked, your lung cancer or mesothelioma may have been a result of exposure to asbestos. And you may qualify for a cash award from the $30 billion in trust funds set aside for lung cancer and mesothelioma victims and their families. For decades, those who worked in the Navy, shipyard, mills, carpentry, firefighting, roofing, insulation, construction, and automotive industries may have unknowingly been exposed to asbestos and have an increased risk in developing lung cancer or mesothelioma. If you or a loved one were recently diagnosed with lung cancer or mesothelioma, even if your loved one has already passed, call right now. Your family still may be entitled to a cash award without ever having to go to court. There are time deadlines to file a claim, so don't wait. Call right now. 1-800-477-0440. Did Alex have some pet names or references he would call you besides boy? Yes. Um, what were those? His pet names for me mostly were his lamb. He would call me his son, as in S-U-N. And lamb, son and his goon at times. All right, let me talk to you specifically about lamb. Yes. What did he tell you he meant by his lamb? As we were intimate, he would tell me, and as he would call me his lamb, he would use it in the holy sacrificial way, as the lamb of Christ or the lamb of God. He would tell me I was his holy sacrifice, I was his lamb. Did that have a specific reference, his lamb, in relationship to what's shown on the cover of the Kierkegaard book? Did he say that to you? Yes, we discussed this deeply. Um, the sacrifice that, or what is shown on the book is the story of Abraham and his struggle as he was called to sacrifice his son, which he had an ultimate love for. And he would discuss to me the beauty and everything that was in the lines and in between the lines for him for that novel, as he would read it to me during intercourse. Wow. I think that testimony gives you tremendous insight into what this world was like, that Ezra and Alex and her friends and everyone who was hanging out. And a lot of time that they spent talking about things like this, and, and other philosophical ideas was at the local coffee house in Eau Claire, Racy's. And uh, Racy's court, uh, uh, Coffee House was the place where Alex worked uh, as a barista at one point, and then was often seen kind of sitting in the corner by himself um, contemplating things. And, and, and people noticed him and said he was very bright, very smart, very thoughtful. Uh, but Ezra painting a picture also involving some darkness. So we are here right now with our think tank on the couch in our own little version of our coffee house so we can have some deep thoughts ourselves tonight. Um, and, and I want to focus on the people in the coffee house at Racy's who spoke about the victim, Alex Woodworth. One of them was Court, who was a friend of Alex's. After they started dating, as much as Alex was an exemplary and unique individual, he was a stereotypical guy in many ways, and I didn't see him <clears throat> much at all until after they had broken up. All right. But so, I was there when he first started, and he, yay, I have a girlfriend. Now that part I understand. I, I, you know, I think everyone can relate to that. that, that other stuff that Ezra was talking about, a little less relatable, but what about Alex's relationship with Ezra? It, it, I mean, it goes from he's excited that he has a girlfriend to potentially that he's going to kill her. Does anyone? 
Is that is that a leap? What I would for have the defense. Wanted, well, what I would have wanted to see more of were past relationships, because when you put up people to talk about his character, I think it's one thing. It's the context that you know someone. Is it you know them from a coffee shop? Is it you know them from a deep, long-standing friendship, or is it a sexual relationship? And each one of those is going to carry a different connotation in the context of how you know that person. I want to know what's he like in other relationships, not how is he in a friendship or at a Who coffee Who do you shop. think in this trial should have brought those witnesses in? The defense. defense. If, the defense. if they're going to help. Because if, if his past relationship, if they're going to come in and they're going to testify how the people in the coffee shop testify, they can stay at home. Well, right, but that's why you interview well, yeah, people and that's you what I'm see saying. what they would say. Exactly. You know. All right, from your experience, do you think, let's say that Alex Woodworth had Hypothetically, I'm not saying this is true, there's no evidence of this, but he had a BDSM relationship with another woman. Do we think that that woman would come in and testify about that? And would let anyone know that they had a BDSM relationship? BDSM bondage, domination, sadism, masochism? Like Some people are, are proud of that. I mean, you know, in this day and age, people are out there with any and everything. And I don't think that would that would be too far fetched that someone would be willing to testify. To talk about it. So the fact that this it. jury didn't hear any of that, what do they take away from it? Do they take away from it that maybe Ezra exaggerated things a little bit here, maybe made some things up they to a certain could, extent? But I mean, who's to say that he was involved with someone else in that way? Maybe that's something that he and McCandless they started together. We don't know. But yeah. I mean, if the defense. You know they probably searched and sifted that out to see if it were other people, other partners he had in similar situations because I think if it was in the effects and to get someone to testify as to how intense those relationships were, that would be helpful to their client. All right, we're going to take a listen to some testimony from another uh, person hanging out at Racy's Coffee Shop. Her name is Brianna, also talking about how Alex felt about Ezra. And uh, did Alex talk to you about his relationship with the defendant? Yes, yeah, sometimes. Um, did he talk about any feelings or emotions he had for the defendant? Yeah. And what did he say? He did tell me that he did love her. That, I mean, that's the L word is pretty serious. I mean, you don't just throw around the, the love word. So obviously there is some passion on one end or the other. Um, who has more of a motive to attack who inside that car? Does Ezra have more of a motive to attack Alex, or does Alex have more of a motive to attack Ezra? They both have motive. I mean, he has motive for her not to leave him. She has motive for her to show, at least according to the, the state's theory, which I think is a little weak, you know, that she needs to prove her love to Mangle. They each have their own motive, I think, to initiate an attack. But which he was one? okay with the breakup. Which one? Who? Uh, the victim. He was okay with, with the breakup. So... Yeah, but if, if, if he's in love with her, he still wants to go on this long drive with her and meet up with her, and it's like, you know, and then, you know, for Mengel to come up, have to come up, evidently break in this house after he chases her down in his bicycle, come up because he thinks he's going to, you know, maybe hurt himself again from what we've heard, it might not be so cut and dry. I think they were in a heated argument, and, I mean, they got to talking, and... How'd they end up in the back seat? That they get, what were they, they doing in the back seat? That's what I'm saying. It got heated. They were talking, and then maybe, you know, they started a little hanky-panky, and, you know, something... I just believe she snapped. Something something triggered her, and, you know, she snapped. Yeah. I, I don't... You don't, I don't think know. it was like a Jody Arias where she kind of lured uh, Travis Alexander into a, a whole bunch of intimate uh, moments and then lures him into the shower and then finds him in a vulnerable position and kills him. You're not seeing that here? No, because we still don't know. We still don't see why would she do that and why would she have a need to do that? Uh, well, I don't know what's going on in her mind. I just know the original plea was not guilty by reason of insanity. That may tell us something. Let's listen to Aubrey again. She's the manager um, because she's trying to give this jury some insight into who Alex is. Is this the type of guy who gets mad? Can you tell us whether or not you would describe him as a peaceful person, a violent person, something in between? I would say I never saw him get angry once. Right. And do you ever see him do anything that would be considered violent? No. Did you ever see him, hear him discuss violence or an interest in violence? Never. 
All right, so can someone who hangs out at that coffee shop a lot and also worked there and never demonstrated any anger, could he have all this deep-seated anger that would drive him to attack a woman that he once loved and that doesn't love him anymore? And, and, if, and if I can't have her, nobody will have her? Because that's basically what she's alleging. She knew him from a coffee shop. I mean, how deep does that relationship really go? How well could she really know him? It's a lot There's of hours. I mean, yeah, a but lot of hours in that coffee in shop. A, in a sexual, loving relationship, who he passionately loves, he's writing poetry about. I mean, it's, they're two different things, and to compare them, I think, is just you're going to find too many problems with it. All right, have let's take heard, a listen yeah. to. Oh, go ahead, go no, ahead. I was going to say, but have we heard anything as far as him being violent or any propensity for violence? Nothing, no, other than his journal. Well, and, right. and, and Ezra. And Ezra. And oh, oh, that's right. Ezra. There was that. Oh. Hey, let's take a listen to Samantha, who talks a little bit about the breakup. And did you uh, later learn that the defendant and Alex's relationship ended? Yes. How did you learn about that? On February 25th, I was texting with Alex. Um, he was going to be coming to my apartment um, because he was going to take over the lease from my current roommate. And um, I told him we were just discussing the lease. And uh, actually, simultaneously, I'd received a message from Ezra on Facebook asking if she could come and look at the apartment because I'd made a, a public post saying that I, I had a room to fill. Um, so when I was texting Alex about the apartment, I also told him that Ezra had reached out and was showing interest as well. Um, up to that time, I didn't know that anything had happened between them. But uh, he asked if I could not mention him because they'd had a falling out the day before, which would have been February 24th. How about that? They have a falling out and they're both trying to get the same apartment. Now they're in competition for the apartment. <laughs> I don't think it's much of a motive. Yeah. Not, um, not a motive, but maybe just a, a fun fact. We'll leave it at that. that. Maybe that was the tipping point was the apartment. That was really... <laughs> How about the fact that the their edge? relationship was very secretive? I mean, that was a big part of this whole thing. I mean, there were people in Racy's who didn't know the nature of the relationship for, for quite some time. Some of them learned about it afterwards. How about the fact that Ezra and Alex's relationship was really on the DL for the most part? Well, it had to be. She had a boyfriend. She had Jason. But it's, it's interesting to see, even with it being so secretive, so many people knew about the dynamics between the two of them in this coffee shop. So you could tell it was a lot of talkings, a lot of rumblings about speculation, probably something what may have been going on. But maybe they just didn't have a definite answer as to what was going on between the two of them at the time. All right. We're done here for now. Don't forget closing arguments tomorrow morning. In this case, in Wisconsin, everything on the line. When we come back, we're going to talk about the next big trial on Court TV. It's about a former NFL star who's accused of being a serial sex offender. That's next. There's something broken in this man. Starting Monday. He's a sociopath. Harvey Weinstein, a Court TV exclusive primetime event. Seema Iyer sits down with the accusers. I walked up to his room with such confidence and walked down feeling I was worth nothing. And the attorneys. They cannot prove these were non-consensual encounters. He knows what he's done. The Weinstein Rape Trial, exclusive interviews, Monday at 8, only on the all-new Court TV. Non-attorney spokesperson. This is a paid advertisement for legal services sponsored by Nightline Legal. Cases assigned on a random basis to participating law firms. See disclaimer for law firms. Attention cancer victims who use the weed killer Roundup. A federal jury unanimously found that Monsanto's popular weed killer Roundup was a substantial factor in causing cancer. You may be entitled to financial compensation. If you or a loved one used Roundup weed killer and were diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, Call the number on your screen now. The World Health Organization has designated glyphosate, the main ingredient in Roundup Weed Killer, a probable human carcinogen. Thousands of agricultural workers may have been exposed to serious health risks by using this product. You may be owed significant compensation from the manufacturer. Call now to find out if you qualify. If you or someone you loved used Roundup and were diagnosed with cancer, call the number on your screen now. Don't wait, there are time deadlines to file a claim. 1-800-568-4852. When you're looking for answers, it's good to have help. Because the right information at the right time may make all the difference. At Humana, we know that's especially true when you're looking for a Medicare supplement insurance plan. 
That's why we're offering seven things every Medicare supplement should have. It's yours free, just for calling the number on your screen. And when you call, a knowledgeable licensed agent producer can answer any questions you have and help you choose the plan that's right for you. The call is free and there's no obligation. You see, Medicare covers only about 80% of your Part B medical expenses. The rest is up to you. That's why so many people purchase Medicare supplement insurance plans like those offered by Humana. They're designed to help you save money and pay some of the costs Medicare doesn't. Depending on the Medicare supplement plan you select, you could have no deductibles or co-payments for doctor visits, hospital stays, emergency care, and more. You can keep the doctors you have now, ones you know and trust, with no referrals needed. Plus, you can get medical care anywhere in the country, even when you're traveling. With Humana, you get a competitive monthly premium and personalized service from a health care partner working to make health care simpler and easier for you. You can choose from a wide range of standardized plans. Each one is designed to work seamlessly with Medicare and help save you money. So how do you find the plan that's right for you? One that fits your needs and your budget. Call Humana now at the number on your screen for this free guide. It's just one of the ways that Humana is making health care simpler. And when you call, a knowledgeable licensed agent producer can answer any questions you have and help you choose the plan that's right for you. The call is free and there's no obligation. You know Medicare won't cover all your medical costs, so call now and see why a Medicare supplement plan from a company like Humana just might be the answer. Winslow took what he wanted. He took what he wanted, not from one, not from two, but three women. He victimized five women. And I submit to you that the crimes that have been brought in this case, as it relates to Jane Doe 1, are kidnapped for rape and oral copulation, rape by force or fear, and oral copulation by force or fear. The pain that she felt was so tremendous that she said she felt herself begin to bleed. That it was when she began to bleed and she was not menstruating, but that as she began to bleed, the defendant just stopped. Jane Doe 2, counts 4 and 5, are raped by force of fear and sodomy by force of fear. The defendant grabbed her neck with both his hands and choked her and told her, if you scream, I will kill you. That he raped her until he stopped and ejaculated into the dirt alongside of her. You're going to hear about Jane Doe 4. Jane Doe 4, as you've heard already, the 17-year-old girl is now grown, married, a mother, 15 years removed from what had happened to her when she was still a child, 15 years removed from what the defendant had done to her when he was 19. She, too, had been victimized. Only it had been many years prior. And that she had stayed silent because she didn't know if anyone would believe her. And she knew who he was. Five women, unknown to each other, barely known to the defendant. All of them have come forward to tell you about his deeds. And I ask you to judge him by his deeds, not who he is and not who his father is. He is the son of San Diego Charger, Hall of Famer, Kelly Lulo Sr. He's been in the spotlight since he was young. And when you're in the spotlight, <clears throat> when you're young, that's very difficult. But one of the key things here is, when you're in the spotlight, people want things from you. There's been infidelity in this relationship. Kelly's not proud of it, but he's never denied it. Jane Doe, too. She's not giving you the whole story. She knows Kellen. She knows who he is. She knows that he's a football star. She knows him by Kellen, not Kevin. She leaves out the fact that we find out later, that we learn that, oh yeah, they did talk about having 
sex for money. Of course, that comes out months after her original statement to the police. He's charged with kidnapping her. She wanted to get into his car. That was her choice. She wanted to. She asked to get into his car. And they have oral sex. Per her original statement, it was not forced. She left that part out of her statement. So when you look at the evidence and the lack of the evidence, and you're not swayed by sympathy or dislike for Kellen's infidelity, I'm sure you'll come to the only right and just verdict there is, the verdict of not guilty. Some of the biggest moments from opening statements in the first rape trial of former NFL player Kellen Winslow II. He was convicted of rape, but the jury was hung on several charges against Winslow. And on Monday, it's opening statement in statements in Kellen Winslow II's retrial. That news coming on the heels of Judge Blaine Bowman severing the misdemeanor counts against the former NFL star involving one of Winslow's elderly accusers known as Jane Doe Number 5. However, Winslow still faces six sexual assault charges and could receive life in prison if convicted of rape of a second victim. Winslow was convicted in June on three counts, including that critical rape charge. The jury was hung on the eight other counts, which prompted this retrial. My think tank's back with me, and we're talking about retrial here. And a, a couple of, first, first thing, um, we're going from five Jane Doe's down to three for the second case. Two of the charges that were hung have been severed, so six counts, three Jane Doe's is, as opposed to five. Who has the advantage second time around, prosecution or defense? I think the prosecution does. I mean, usually, you know, in the defense, if you put up a good, you know, defense at a trial and you get a jury to hang on counts, that's a good job. And it's tough to try and repeat that because, you know, it's just going back, recounting, and picking a jury again because sometimes you pick a great jury, but you may not be as lucky that second go round. So I think is the state has the advantage in these types of situations when they retry cases or they retry counts that were hung in the first trial. Agreed? Right, I agree. And you have this lingering conviction that's luring over his head as well. And I think that's going to be something that they will be thinking about, that he's already been convicted, uh, you know, before. So what makes this any different? You know, and I, I, that would be in my head that he's already been found guilty on, for something. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be hard for him to get over. How about going from five down to three Jane Doe's in this trial? Does, are, make, does it make a difference? Yeah, it does. And I think there are positive aspects of this being retried for him. I mean, it'd be better if it just wasn't. But I think being retried helps him because now they have testimony of how they know how everyone's going to take the stand, how they're going to te testify, what they're going to say. I think the biggest, you know, the part that's going to hurt him the most are those convictions. And there's no way to really get around that going forward. I do think that, again, these should have been severed. I thought they should have been severed the first time around, but they, they weren't. weren't. But they weren't. They weren't. But going forward, we do know that at least some of this has been, which is good for him as well. Right, because it could have been for Jane Doe's. Let's um, take a look at Jane Doe number one, because Jane Doe number one, all three counts involving her, the jury was split. And of all the counts, they were most evenly split on hers. Let's take a look. Jane Doe number one is a 54-year-old hitchhiker who says Winslow, after picking her up in a black Jeep, drove behind a shopping center, forced her to perform oral sex, and then raped her. She reported the incident four days later. Winslow's DNA was detected in a sample taken from her pants, but Jane Doe one was unable to identify Winslow in court during the preliminary hearing, pointing to his attorney instead. On the day that this happened, did you want to have sex with the man who had picked you up in his car? No. Did you want to be taken to the back of that shopping center uh, against your will? No. Did you want to perform oral sex on him? No. Would you have done any of those things if he hadn't threatened to kill you? No. You came to court, you testified before uh, the lawyers and the judge, right? Remember that? Yes. Okay. And you remember, you pointed out this man, Right. Being the individual who raped you. Remember that? Yes. Okay. This man I'm standing in front of. Him. Yes. For the record, this is Mr. Watkins. The record will so oh, reflect. Okay. Is that still the person who raped you? No, it's the one next to you. We know that it was him. We know that the sex act occurred. 
We know where it occurred. So why is she being cross-examined at length about whether it was a Jeep or if she saw a Jeep emblem? We have surveillance video from his own surveillance system that shows him leaving in his black H2 Hummer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, that's where it happened. Where else could it have happened? You know, I'm sorry. You know, they're gonna, they're gonna have to say, we don't take, we take our victims as we find them. Well, she's not. She's not a victim. Because clearly, she's not frozen. She climbed a fence. She put her hands into a, into a chain link fence and climbed over a fence, took the care to throw her valuables over the fence, and did it again. It's not a victim. All right, she's a little bit older than he is, actually a lot older than he is. She's in her 50s, he's in his, her, in his 30s, 30s, right? She's a hitchhiker. He's a guy who earned $40 million in the NFL. What was going on here? What? The question what was is, going, why are you they picking saying up it was consensual. What's that? Why are you picking up hitchhikers in the first place? I mean, that would be my major question and a hurdle that he would have to get over. Why are you picking up strangers? Uh, I mean, usually high profile people just don't go around doing that, especially if you're a high profile person, you're worried about your safety. Um, you know, not, oh, I'm going to pick this person up and give them a ride and just be a good Samaritan. I don't buy it. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> That's interesting. I mean, like we say with the age difference here, you have a 54-year-old woman, a hitchhiker, and you have Kalen, Kellen Winslow, who's in his early 30s, and it just doesn't really seem, uh, we don't even know what the reasoning would be as to why you would just assist and pick up a hitchhiker this day and age, especially with the type of violence you could put yourself in. He's famous, you know, he's a public figure. But at the same time, I mean, I think his attorney was trying to paint the picture that some of these encounters may have been consensual more so than him just forcing himself on these women or actually raping them. All right, when we come back, two more Jane Doe's who will be a part of this retrial. We'll talk about them when we return. Attention. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services has officially authorized new benefits that Medicare Advantage plans may include. To get the benefits you deserve, you can call the Medicare Coverage Helpline. Hi, I'm Joe Namath. If you're on Medicare, this is important information. I called the Medicare Coverage Helpline and they instantly looked up my coverage. In this one simple call, they offered to enroll me in a plan that includes rides to medical appointments, private home aides, doctors and nurses visits by telephone, and even home delivered meals. The plan also includes dental, vision, hearing, and prescription drug coverage, all at no additional cost. Don't delay. Call to see if the new benefits are available in your area. Call the number on your screen now. It's free. Call 1-800-497-5903. That's 1-800-497-5903 now. If you use a CPAP system, then you know it leads to better sleep. But do you know that a dirty CPAP system could lead to sickness and infections? Introducing SleepAid. Everything you need to quickly and easily clean your CPAP supplies, hands-free, including any size mask and both heated and non-heated tubing. Just place your supplies in the filter bag. And with just one click, SleepAid does the rest, using ozone instead of liquids or solvents to kill certain germs and bacteria that can lead to mold, sinus issues, and sickness. Unlike some other cleaning devices, SleepAid needs no adapters, is whisper quiet, and can be stored in a drawer or even your carry-on luggage to keep your accessories clean when you travel. Get SleepAid for you or someone you love with a 30-day money-back guarantee. For a limited time, get free shipping. Call 1-800-440-2504. That's 1-800-440-2504. Or go to mysleepaid.com. If you have Medicare, listen up. The Medicare enrollment deadline is only weeks away. With so many changes, do you know if your plan is still the right fit? Having the wrong plan may cost you thousands of dollars out of pocket. And that's why I love Health Markets, your insurance marketplace. With their new Fit Score, they compare thousands of plans from national insurance companies to find the right Medicare plan that fits you. Call or visit Health Markets to find your Fit Score today. In minutes, you can find out if your current plan is the right fit or if there's another one that can get you extra coverage or help save you money. Best of all, their service is completely free. Does your plan have $0 copays, $0 deductibles, and $0 premiums? 
If not, maybe it's not the right fit. Does it include dental and vision coverage? Well, if not, maybe it's not the right fit. How about hearing aids, glasses, and gym memberships at no additional cost? Maybe there's a better fit for you. Call Health Markets now or visit healthmarkets.com for your free fit score. We can instantly compare thousands of Medicare plans with all of these benefits and more, including plans that may let you keep your doctor and save money. With the annual Medicare enrollment deadline coming, don't waste another minute not knowing if you have the right Medicare fit. For this free service, go to healthmarkets.com or call right now. Having help enroll people in millions of policies with an A-plus customer satisfaction rating? You can trust Health Markets. Don't assume that your plan is still the right fit. The Health Markets Fit Score makes it easy to find the right Medicare plan for you. Health Markets doesn't just work for one insurance company. They work to help you, and they do it all for free. Your insurance marketplace, Health Markets. There may be Medicare benefits and savings you're missing out on. Only Health Markets has the free fit score. Call 800-290-6422 before the deadline. That's 800-290-6422. A 59-year-old self-described homeless woman, Jane Doe, too, says Kellen Winslow offered to take her to coffee on Mother's Day 2018. After getting into his vehicle, she says Winslow drove to a remote location where he raped and sodomized her while threatening to kill her. There's no DNA evidence, but Jane Doe, too, went to police the next morning and has no problem identifying Kellen Winslow. He, like, held me, grabbed my arms. And um, I, I don't know what else he said, but we're, he says we're going to have sex. And I said, please don't do this. And um, I said it about four times. And um, something like, a, it's a done deal. At the same time, you, know, you said that you, you met Mr. Winslow um, probably about six months prior that this happened. I really don't want to look at him, sir. I don't appreciate it. Appreciate what? What's it you don't appreciate? That I have to look at my rapist. I think you should be further over. Jane Doe number two. Soft-spoken. Timid. Shuddering. Afraid afraid of being in the same room as her rapist, afraid to even look at him. Is that all an act? Is that a lie? Well, certainly not. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, she had something taken from her by this man in court, and do not allow his status or his name to take away from that. Make no mistake, Jane Doe number two had something taken from her that cannot be given back, that cannot be made whole. And you saw that on display before you. After she reported this, this strangulation, this choking by this man, she looked in the mirror and saw that she had no marks, nothing, zero. You didn't hear anything from any evidence tech about DNA found in her finger, fingernails, and her fingernails, from scratching she did of this individual, about any bruising that was on her hands. Remember she said that this guy grabbed her by the hands and, and pushed her down? No bruising on the hands, no bruising on the fingers, no bruising on the legs, no bruising on the back, no bruising on any single part of her body. Nothing, zero, no evidence whatsoever. So, ladies and gentlemen, Let's be clear about this. The only evidence of any assault comes from her, and that's it. Don't be fooled to say there's some type of circumstantial evidence that, that, they, pre that they presented, which is credible, because there's nothing. All right, so Jane Doe number two, there was a conviction for forcible rape, but on the sodomy charge, the jury was hung. So as we get to the retrial here, this is an important witness, because she came across very credibly to that first jury. Yeah, no, she did, out of all the witnesses that I saw, number two, by far, I thought was the best. And it shows in the fact that they got that actual rape conviction with her, the only one 
So, yeah, I think just on its face, it's apparent how well she did. All right. Jane Doe, number four, is a little different than the other two. She was a lot younger at the time, uh, but the charges a lot older. They go back to 2003.